Anthony Pettis lived up to his nickname Showtime. The fighter from Milwaukee made a name for himself early on by going 13-1. and And in the process, not only did he become the WBC lightweight champion, but he also won the belt in highlight reel fashion with his Showtime kick. There was a lot of hype behind him once he signed with the UFC. And although he lost in his debut, he won his next four fights and this led to him capturing the UFC lightweight championship. All signs were pointing to him becoming a superstar as he was getting some huge endorsement deals at the time. But after one title defense, he lost the belt. And since then, he has gone 6-9 and nine in 15 fights. So how good was Anthony Pettis actually? Hey guys, it's Keon and today I'm going to be talking about Anthony Showtime Pettis. And this is a video that many of you have requested. And I decided to make it after he has gone 0-2 in the PFL. Even though these fights were close, Anthony would have won them easily back in the day. Because not only was he very skilled, but he was also one of the most entertaining fighters around. But these days were a while back and people tend to forget how exciting his rise to the top was. So in this video, we're going to take a look at his MMA career to really understand how good he was. But first, shout out to the undisputed members of my Patreon. They get the extra perk of a shout out before each video. But even the intro members get early access and video to the Keon Kamara podcast. And as always, the money goes to charity. Now let's get to it. Anthony began his MMA career on January 27th, 2007 on the day he turned 20. Prior to his debut, he trained in Taekwondo, boxing, and did some wrestling in college. His first opponent was Thomas Spammer. It took Anthony 24 seconds to connect with a flurry of punches that ended the fight. After picking up another win, he fought Michael Skinner. Anthony pressed forward with punches right away. Michael got dropped by a knee and although he got back up, Anthony connected with more punches that finished him off. The fight lasted 36 seconds. He picked up another victory before fighting Mike Lambrecht. Anthony opened up with some hard punches. Mike got hurt but was able to buy some time by securing a takedown. But Anthony was able to get back up and connect with a head kick that knocked him out. Three months later, he fought for the GFS lightweight championship. His opponent was Sharon Leggett. Anthony got taken down many times in this fight, but he was able to reverse Sharon a few times and also connect with some nice shots on the feet. It was close, but by the end, Anthony won by split decision, making him the GFS lightweight champion. After defending the belt, Anthony moved up to welterweight to take a fight on short notice. He initially tried out for the ninth season of The Ultimate Fighter, but he didn't make it on the show. His first opponent at 170 was Gabe Walbridge. Anthony dropped him with a head kick and finished him off with punches and knees on the ground. After going 8-0, he made his debut with the WEC. At WEC 41, he went back down to lightweight and fought Mike Campbell. Anthony opened up the fight with a head kick and a guillotine choke, and although he got taken down, he attempted an armbar off his back. Mike escaped, but he got caught in a triangle that forced him to tap. At WEC 45, Anthony fought Bart Palaszewski. It was a very competitive fight as both men had their moments on the feet and on the ground. Anthony had more success with his striking, while Bart had more success with his grappling. It could have went to either man, but by the end, Bart won by split decision, handing Anthony his first defeat in MMA. At WEC 47, he fought Danny Castillo. After Danny secured a takedown and connected with a knee that went low, Anthony connected with a head kick and punches that knocked him out. At WBC 48, he fought Alex Karalexis. Anthony got taken down multiple times but was able to deny most of the takedowns in general. This led to Alex getting picked apart on the feet. In round 2, Anthony got taken down again but this time he locked up a triangle choke that forced the tap. At WBC 50, Anthony fought Shane Roller. Anthony was the aggressor on the feet and on the ground for the entire fight. And in the final 15 seconds, he locked up a triangle choke that forced Shane to tap. At WEC 53, Anthony fought for the WEC lightweight championship. His opponent was champion, Benson Henderson. This was a back and forth battle as both men had their moments on the feet and on the ground. Going into round 5, it was any man's fight. And even that round was close, until Anthony ran off the cage and connected with a high kick that dropped Benson. This was epic. And although Benson survived to the final bell, this may have been enough for Anthony to win by unanimous decision, making him the new WEC lightweight champion. Anthony became a viral sensation because of this kick. And with the WEC merging with the UFC, there was a lot of hype behind him going into the new promotion. This included an immediate shot at the title against the winner of Frankie Edgar vs. Gray Maynard at UFC 125. But that fight went to a draw and with Anthony not willing to wait, he instead took a fight against Clay Guida. Clay was the aggressor with his wrestling as he secured takedowns and maintained top control. Anthony stayed busy on the ground with submission attempts, but it wasn't enough. After three rounds, Clay won by unanimous decision. At UFC 136, Anthony fought Jeremy Stevens. This was a competitive fight as both men had their moments on the feet and on the ground. But in the end, Anthony won by split decision. At UFC 144, he fought Joe Lozon. Anthony finished the fight early in round 1 with a head kick and punches. 11 months later, he fought Donald Cerrone. Anthony was controlling the action on the feet. This led to kicks to the body that dropped Donald. Anthony threw some punches before the ref stepped in. Although he set himself up as a clear number 1 contender, Anthony didn't want to wait to get his shot at the title. So he decided that he wanted to go down to Fathom 
featherweight to challenge the champion, Jose Aldo. But he ended up sustaining a knee injury which caused him to back out of the fight. So he came back at UFC 164 to fight for the UFC lightweight championship in Milwaukee. His opponent was champion Benson Henderson, making it their second meeting. Benson tried to bring the fight down but his attempts got denied. Anthony connected on the feet before attempting a kick that had him end up on his back. But while there, he locked up an armbar that forced Benson to tap, making Anthony Pettis the new UFC lightweight champion. Although he was supposed to defend the belt against TJ Grant and Josh Thompson, both fights fell out with one of them due to another knee injury for Anthony. There was also talks of featherweight champion Jose Aldo moving up to challenge for the belt, but instead Anthony became a coach on the 20th season of The Ultimate Fighter. The opposing coach was former Strikeforce lightweight champion Gilbert Melendez. Following the season, the two fought at UFC 181, making it Anthony's first fight in 16 months. This was a competitive bout that saw both men connect with some big shots. Then in round 2, Gilbert got rocked on the feet which led to a desperation takedown. Anthony locked up a guillotine choke that forced a tap. At UFC 185, he fought Rafael Dos Anjos. Anthony got dominated as he was getting out wrestled for all 5 rounds. This also led to him eating some big shots on the feet. By the end, Rafael won by unanimous decision, making him the new UFC lightweight champion. After sustaining another injury, Anthony came back 10 months later and fought former Bellator lightweight champion, Eddie Alvarez. Anthony was the aggressor on the feet for most of the fight, but Eddie controlled the action both in the clinch and on the ground. After 3 rounds, he won by split decision. At UFC 197, Anthony fought Edson Barboza. The two strikers battled on the feet for the entire fight. Although Anthony had many moments, it was Edson who landed the more significant shots. By the end, Edson won by unanimous decision. Following this 3 fight losing streak, Anthony moved down to 145. His first opponent at featherweight was Charles Oliveira. Anthony got taken down a few times and also had to defend submissions. But on the feet, Charles was eating some big punches and kicks. In the third, he tried to bring the fight down again, but this time he got caught in a guillotine that forced him to tap. At UFC 206, Anthony fought for the UFC interim featherweight championship. His opponent was Max Holloway, but Anthony missed weight by 3 pounds which made him ineligible to win the belt. Regardless, the bout went on and Max controlled the action everywhere the fight went. In round 3, Anthony got finished by a kick to the body and a barrage of punches. After this defeat, he went back up to lightweight and fought Jim Miller. For 3 rounds, Anthony was the aggressor both on the feet and on the ground. By the end, he won by unanimous decision. 4 months later, Anthony fought Dustin Poirier. Dustin secured a few takedowns, attempted submissions, and did some damage on top. This led to Anthony's face getting busted up, but he stayed in there and was able to attempt submissions, reverse the position, and throw some shots of his own. Unfortunately, in round 3, he suffered a rib injury that forced him to tap. At UFC 223, he was set to fight Ultimate Fighter Season 15 winner, Michael Chiesa, but Michael pulled out after suffering an injury from the Conor McGregor bus incident. And with Tony Ferguson pulling out of the main event title fight due to injury, Anthony was willing to step in to fight Khabib Nurmagomedov, but he requested $1 million for this fight, which the UFC was not willing to give. So at UFC 226, Anthony fought Michael Chiesa. Anthony was the aggressor on the feet for most of the fight, and in round 2, he connected with a right hand and a knee that dropped Michael. Anthony locked up a triangle armbar that forced a tap. At UFC 229, he fought former UFC interim lightweight champion, Tony Ferguson. This was a fun back and forth war that saw both men connect on the feet. Then early in round 2, Tony got dropped by a right hand. The fight looked moments from being over, but he survived and began to outstrike Anthony until the end of the round. The fight was stopped before round 3 as Anthony broke his hand. Following this defeat, he moved up to welterweight. His first opponent back at 170 was Steven Thompson. Anthony was getting battered on the feet for most of the fight. But then in round 2, he connected with a Superman punch that knocked Steven out. At UFC 241, Anthony fought Ultimate Fighter Season 5 winner, Nate Diaz. This was a grueling fight that saw both men land some hard shots. But as the fight went on, Nate was the fresher fighter. He also had some moments on the ground. By the end, he won by unanimous decision. At UFC 246, Anthony went back down to lightweight and fought Carlos Diego Ferreira. After trading on the feet, Carlos brought the fight down in round 2. This led to a rear naked choke that forced Anthony to tap. At UFC 249, he fought Donald Cerrone, making it their second meeting. This was an action-packed fight that saw both men connect on the feet. Although Donald had his moments with his striking and also brought the fight down a couple of times, Anthony landed the more significant shots. By the end, he won by unanimous decision. Seven months later, Anthony fought Alex Morono. Anthony was controlling the action on the feet for most of the fight. In the final 30 seconds, he connected with a spinning heel kick that rocked Alex. Although Anthony was unable to finish the fight, he still won by unanimous decision. With that fight being the last on his contract, he decided not to re-sign with the UFC. So 
So in December of 2020, Anthony signed with the PFL. His first fight with the promotion was against Clay Collard. Anthony was backing up for most of the fight and even got dropped a couple of times by punches. But he was also close to finishing Clay with a head kick and a flying knee. Regardless, it wasn't enough and by the end, Clay won by unanimous decision. At PFL 6, Anthony fought Haush Manfio. It was a close fight but by the end, Haush won by split decision. This was Anthony's most recent fight and although he'll still be fighting, it's clear that his days at the top have come to an end. Regardless, he is still a tough fight for anyone and always knows how to put on a show. So after going 24 and 12 in a career that saw him become the UFC, the WEC, and the GFS lightweight champion, how good was Anthony Pettis actually? He is a huge reason for the evolution of the sport. His unorthodox style of fighting with some experiment with new attacks has paved the way for fighters today. When I think about fighters like Tony Ferguson, Sean O'Malley, Yair Rodriguez, and Yuri Prohaska, I think about Anthony Pettis who was the catalyst for the way they fight. I also credit Anderson Silva for this as well. But when Anthony came to the UFC, he was the face of the new school era. An era that saw fighters become even more skilled than the one Anderson Silva fought in. So his flashy style of fighting had to evolve with the new generation. And that's what Anthony did. Everyone knew him because of the Showtime kick and that in itself indicated that MMA was evolving. When I saw that kick for the first time, I was amazed because no one would have thought to attack in that manner. And not only did Anthony attempt it, but he also connected. It wasn't just a flashy move, it was effective. And now we see fighters utilizing the cage more for when they attack. In fact, Anthony's entire style of fighting gave fighters the confidence to be more experimental. The Showtime kick was also the first viral moment for MMA. It happened back in 2010 when social media platforms like Instagram and Twitter were really beginning to boom. So when that kick happened, it was seen by many. And that in itself is why I have to give credit to Anthony for helping the sport grow as a whole. But aside from this moment, he was an incredibly technical fighter. Apart from being unorthodox with his attacks, his punches and kicks were solid. When he pressed forward, it was a nightmare for any fighter. His chin was also very strong and because of it, he never got knocked out cold. He was a threat to most of his opponents while on the feet. But the same could be said on the ground. His jiu-jitsu was dangerous, especially while off his back. He was also good at defending submissions and reversing the position. His skills truly made him an unpredictable fighter. And what really helped was his athleticism. He was very fast, he carried a lot of power, and his cardio was top notch. But once these qualities began to diminish, so did Anthony. He got injured a lot, especially during his championship run. And in my opinion, that was the start of his decline. And naturally, athletic abilities tend to decrease as one ages. But on top of that, he was also taking a lot of damage. He's been in war after war with some of the best fighters in the world. His resume is insane as he has fought top fighters at featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight. And although he continued to show glimpses of greatness after losing the belt, he wasn't consistent. Plus, he never really evolved as a fighter. He always fought the same way and after a while, his competition would recognize the holes in his game. He never improved on his takedowns or takedown defense. He'd have a hard time when the distance would close, especially against the cage. And overall, he never fought with a strategy or game plan against certain fighters. He stayed the same while his competition evolved. And with already having reached the pinnacle of the sport, it's really hard for one to be motivated to get back there after they've done it. Regardless, he is a certified legend. He not only became a champion, but he also changed the game. That's why I would give his MMA career a 9 out of 10. He will be forever immortalized in the history of the sport. His style was a mix of technical and flashy, and he proved that it could work in the modern age of MMA. So the next time you see someone with an unorthodox style of fighting, remember that it was inspired by a fighter like Anthony Pettis. My name is Keon, and this is my take on Anthony Showtime Pettis. Do you agree, disagree, or have something else to add? Please put in the comments down below, because I love to read it. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. But that's all I have for now, so I'll see you in my next one.